Hello chess fans. Today we're going to look at a game between Anatoly Karpov and Robert Hubner. In a recent video, I said that I thought Anatoly Karpov's game against Gula Sachs might be one of his most speculative sacrifices. I think that's true, but I think that today's game against Robert Hubner, one of the greatest German players of all time and a world championship contender, uh, is the most definitively the most uh, speculative that Anatoly Karpov has ever been. I think if you just gave this game to a player who had never seen it before and asked him who played it, the most likely answer would be Tao. This is very Tao-like in terms of offering a sacrifice that later computer analysis shows not to be fully effective and fully correct, but in practice it proved to be very hard for Robert Hubner to meet. So let's get straight to the game. Anatoly Karpov opens with e4, and Robert Hubner responds with the Karo Khan defense. Later, this would be one of Anatoly Karpov's favorite defenses. I'm going to skip through the opening fairly quickly. This has all been played really quite a few times, hundreds and hundreds of times, I mean by quite a few. And we're going to jump to move 13 here. At this point, instead of knight e5, King b1 is more popular. This move is kind of surprising to new players often. Why would you take time out from what you're doing to move your king? They say that you really have to be a grandmaster to understand when you should take time out for a move like King b1 to prepare your play uh, in a more safer, uh, in a more safe way. Uh, and when is this move actually just a waste of time? I'm not really there yet, so I'm not fully sure why king b1 would necessarily be safer, but this is normal to see what black does before white continues the play. Now, black continues with castles after white's move of knight e5 instead of king b1, and c4 and c5. This was Hubner's novelty in the game, his new move that he had prepared. This move invites white to play in an aggressive way, and Karpov takes up the challenge. Pawn d5, and after an exchange on e5, Hubner reveals his idea. This move, knight g4, seems to be a very strong move. The knight is threatening the bishop on e5 and threatening the pawn on f2. And a normal move, like queen e2, would simply allow black to exchange off the strong bishop. And after a move like bishop f6, black is for choice. The center pawn that white has is not nearly as important as the strength of black's bishop over the white knight. So this is a very good position for black and is exactly what Hubner was hoping to get in the game. Instead, Karpov chose to kind of upend Hubner's entire plan here. And he goes for it with bishop takes g7 here. This is the Tau-like sacrifice that I mentioned earlier and is kind of the defining moment in the game. This game also reminds me of Kasparov Portish, where Kasparov offers a bishop uh, sacrifice also on g7 to, uh, to initiate his play uh, just a little more quickly. Now, after bishop takes g7, black has two choices. I'm basically not going to get into knight takes f2, but it is quite a reasonable option and may even be black's best choice. You can take a look at the PGN if you want to dive into this analysis a little more deeply. Instead, Hubner chooses to accept Karpov's sacrifice and take with king takes g7. Queen e2 now, stepping out of the way of the rook, so a pawn capture will open an attack on the black queen and starts to be quite threatening, and creating an attack on the knight. This is the idea, one of the ideas, behind Karpov's bishop sacrifice on g7. Now, this is obviously an important uh, moment in the game. Uh, Black does have a few ways to respond to the attack on the knight. And it seems that Black picks the wrong choice, although there are many mistakes both players have yet to make in this game. The correct move seems to be pawn f5. Expanding with the f-pawn might seem like it loosens Black's king's position, but expanding with the f-pawn also gives Black's king a little more room to run, gives Black's rook a little more flexibility in defense, and tactically, frankly, it just works out. 
The main point is after pawn takes e6, queen c7, there's a threat of queen f4 check, which would happen after, for example, rook to d7. And knight takes f5 is a little bit of a tactic, but after rook takes, queen takes check, hitting the king and the rook, bishop g5 is also check, and after the king moves over, queen f4, the queens seem to be coming off, and white's remaining pawns are going to be quite weak. Black is heavily for choice here and has a good chance to win this game. So this f5 move seems to be really effective and to be kind of a, uh, a sound refutation of Karpov's play. But it's hard to go for this line, and there's a lot of complexity here. Instead, Hubner played bishop to g5 check. Now, there's no question that Hubner was not a patzer. He's a very, very strong player. But the saying, patzer sees check, patzer gives check, comes to mind. This check is a little bit hasty. It has some function, like defending the h6 pawn, adding another move before move 40 so that there can be potentially some benefits on the clock, you know, and gaining maybe more time to think about the next move. But what we discover in a moment is after king b1, the effective move f5 that would have been good last turn is no longer good because of this bishop check. After pawn takes now, queen c7, rook to d7 is check because there is no bishop on e7. And so this line wins for white. Without the possibility of playing this f5 move, black's defenses are a little more stretched. Instead, black now retreats the knight that is attacked on g4. White takes on e6, opening up an attack on the queen. The queen needs to move and picks the e7, I'm sorry, the c8 square. Now, white can play knight f5 check. That's an interesting move, equally valid uh, as compared to e7, which is played in the game. If you want to consider knight to f5 check a little more deeply, you can look at the analysis, but I'm going to let that go for now. So after e7, the rook needs to move. It steps over to e8, and black's idea now is queen e6, offering a queen trade, and then getting the pawn on e7. Karpov's move is really beautiful. He plays rook d6, stopping queen e6 in its tracks and planting this kind of bone in black's throat where the rook starts to be really, really dangerous. Instead, rook to e1 or queen c2 were also good ways to make queen e6 undesirable and seem to be a little better according to the computer. Still, this is a very instructive prophylactic move and is very difficult for Hubner to meet. He now makes a bit of a mistake. He offers a queen trade with g4, queen g4. Instead, a good move was bishop f4, attacking the rook and trying to exchange off the knight. This is obviously a move that Hubner would have considered. I have no doubt that he saw this move, and I have no doubt that Karpov saw this move. However, the surprising rook takes f6 now is a good move. King takes, queen f3 check. I'm sorry, not queen f3 check, queen f3 making a pin on the bishop. And this bishop is lost. After this bishop is captured, it seems like white will have a very good attack. White will have at least one pawn for the exchange, and black's king seems to be still unsafe. The thing is, actually, black is going to be able to find some measure of safety, and this line is very important to evaluate. There are similar lines kind of throughout the play in this game where black could have successfully challenged white's play. Queen c7, not expecting to be able to defend the bishop in the long term, but still queen c7 is a good move, and it means that white is going to have to take a little more time to go get the bishop. Rook h4 now does that. But now king takes e7, and after the bishop falls, king to f8 gives black reasonable security for the king. White doesn't have an obvious way to continue the attack, and actually, even though he has a pawn for the exchange, which seems like reasonable compensation, rook over to d8 is coming, possibly rook e1 check is coming, and in general, there are just too many open lines for the black rooks. The black heavy pieces are very, very strong, and black should be favored here. This is an important consideration. It seems like one pawn for the exchange and uh, an improved development for white should be enough, but the rooks are going to dominate in the next few moves for black. So backing up, after uh, missing 
bishop to f4. Black played queen to g4. Now, trading queens was actually quite an interesting possibility, and you can examine that in the notes. Instead, Karpov kept the queens on and tried to keep his bind with queen to e5. Now, knight f5 check is a threat, followed by rook takes f6, or possibly many other things. White's position is very, very threatening to be, uh, to say the least. Now, the king needs to move out of the pin in this position, which means king g8 or king a7 should be selected. There's a very important difference between the two that was missed by the players in the game. If you want to pause your video and try and figure out whether black should put the king on g8 or the king on h7, you can do that. The correct move proves to be king h7. Why is king h7 preferable to king g8? The surprising answer, and full credit to the computer for this, is that knight g8 is now a threat. The knight needs the g8 square more than the king. And after knight g8, black will find himself in a position to attack e7, to secure h6, and generally to cover all the key squares. Knight g8 is so strong here that white really needs to play rook takes f6, bishop takes, and queen takes. And now white has some compensation for the exchange, but again, it probably is insufficient after a line like this. At some point, the e7 pawn will fall, white will have one pawn for the exchange, but the major factor is that black's rooks will have open lines, and they should be very, very strong in the emerging position. Instead, Huebner picked the wrong square, king g8, and now white's attack remains quite dangerous. Karpov plays rook over, activating the rook that was not, not yet participating in the attack. And now Hubner had to play knight takes h5, a very greedy move and a very complicated move. And you can look at one of the many, many lines that could have emerged after knight takes e5 in the notes to the game. However, he made the losing mistake here, but it only loses to a really beautiful combination. Knight to d7, retreating and attacking the queen. If you want to pause your video and figure out the winning line that Karpov now selected, I would encourage you to do that. It really is beautiful. Karpov now plays rook takes d7, queen takes d7, and knight f5. Now the threat of mate on g7 is obviously very strong, but black does have the move pawn to f6. So we would need to see the next move to understand that this position is winning. Queen to d5 check. Despite being down an entire rook, Karpov offers an exchange of queens. Black is completely uh, bound up in this position. After the forced trade of queens, black has no way to stop pawn to d6 and pawn to d7. Basically, in this position, Hubner could resign, but the finish is very beautiful, and we can admire Karpov's patience in this position. First, the bishop retreats ready to sacrifice for the pawn that wants to go to d6. Karpov improves first with the move pawn g3, and then he improves again by activating his king. Pawn to b5 for black. There's really nothing constructive for black to do, so b5 is as good as anything. Knight takes h6, check. The king moves, and the knight simply steps back. White has gained another pawn. And now Karpov's idea is after rook g8, or any other move, Pawn to d6. Bishop takes, knight takes, would have been winning before. He didn't need to win the pawn on h6, but the endgame will be even more winning and more simple now that he's won an extra pawn by taking on h6. So, knowing that he will lose if he takes on d6, Hubner tries some alternative path, even though he can't expect success. He attacks the rook, and the rook steps up. Rook steps up and attacks the white knight, and the pawn on f5, Karpov could already be pushing, but he takes on f6 first. Again, so controlled. The rook takes on h5. The pawn goes to d7. Beautiful, beautiful connected pawns on the 7th rank. The rook steps down and attacks f2, and Karpov simply defends that as well with knight to e3. Now, obviously, there's no stopping a promotion of the connected pawns, and basically white is going to be a queen up in a moment. Because he's going to queen a pawn, the rook will take, and he'll queen an entire new pawn. 
So this game is completely over and Hubner chose to resign here. I hope you really enjoyed that game. This was a really delightful speculative bishop takes g7 sacrifice from Karpov. The ensuing tactics and the defensive opportunities offered to Hubner are also really, really instructive. We shouldn't underestimate the value of those defensive combinations, ideas like king h7 and various other uh, continuations like bishop f4. Of course, this is all being found with computers decades after the game was actually played, and one could not expect the players to find this all at the board. It's often noted that being the attacking player has the advantage of a kind of a simpler line of play. Typically, if you're the attacker, if you make a mistake, you'll still have some kind of attack and compensation. Maybe not enough, but you'll have something. If you're the defender and you make a mistake like allowing rook takes d7, the game basically ends on the spot. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you liked it, please consider sharing it with a friend so that they can check it out too. Uh, otherwise, have a wonderful day, and I hope to see you again as we bring out a new video next week. Thank you.